always bend toward what the world considers a certain day or what is expected because of that day. I don't always bend to the theme that's being celebrated. We certainly are recognizing mothers and we'll soon recognize fathers. But I really felt in my heart to focus on a message that kind of relates to today. And that is the message of the original mother. The original mother. And it's found, of course, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. She was referred to as the mother of all living, and I'll get to the insight attached to that in just a minute. But I first want to share with you something really amazing. I found on the internet baby pictures of Adam and Eve. So amazing. Baby pictures of Adam and Eve. You're supposed to laugh. A pile of dust and a bone. Now, if God can start an entire human race that is now into the billions out of a pile of dust and a bone, he can take things in your life that seem insufficient, inadequate, and produce something powerful and wonderful out of it. And I want you to notice that a bone has a lot more stability than a pile of dust. And it's far more long-lasting than a pile of dust. Because when people are buried years later, you don't find a lot of the dust, but you'll find the bones. So they have a stability about them. And maybe women have an inner fortitude, an inner stability that gives them the grace to enter into motherhood successfully because that takes a lot of stability and a lot of strength. So possibly that picture is a picture of that inner fortitude that God gives. Let's go back to the reason the woman was created, Genesis 2.18. And the Lord God said, and I want you to notice the Lord God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, that word was Elohim, which is a plural word translated singular over 2,000 times in the Old Testament. In the beginning, God. Well, that's the omniscient God, the omnipresent God, the omnipotent God, the formless God, the God of infinitude who exists infinitely in the past, present, and future. But then when he made Adam and when he made Eve, the first father and mother, He became not just God in his magnificence and greatness, but he became the Lord God. And in the original Hebrew, it's Yahweh Elohim. He became personal, personalized. He came down to our level to lift us up to his level. And the connecting link between the two was worthless dust out of which a bone was retrieved. Think of that. He came down to lift us up to his level. And the Lord God said in Genesis 2.18, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. And that's where you get the word help mate. It is kind of a, a transformation of the original words help meet. And the word meet is an old archaic English word we don't use anymore That means fit, worthy, suitable, or sufficient. I will make a helper fit for him, suitable for him, sufficient for him, worthy of him, and he's worthy of her. They're going to be on an equal level. I'm not going to take from the head to make this woman. I'm not going to take from the feet. I'm going to take from the side because there's an equality that is implied in that fact that he took a rib from Adam's rib cage. I think it's kind of interesting and humorous too that as soon as God laid eyes on man, he said, this guy needs help. And so he created woman. But I also think, and this is more serious, that the reason God recognized the need in Adam before something existed to meet that need is because God recognized in himself a need before the thing existed to meet that need. God 
realized his own aloneness and how much more marvelous it would be if he created a way, if he made a way for a bride to come forth to whom he could be married eternally and share himself with completely. And the reason he fell aloneness in Adam and went about the task of meeting that need is because God felt aloneness within himself. So he made a completion for Adam. Adam was incomplete prior to his union with Eve. He was incomplete. But now he's finished. Once the woman is created, Adam is completed. And once the bride of Christ is created, God is completed. Now, God would be complete within himself if he chose to be. But God, by his own choosing, has designed that he is incomplete until his bride will bring him to fullness. And if you think that's a little bit outlandish to believe that, the scripture says that we are the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's in Ephesians chapter 1. That we are the fullness of him. Come on, say that with me now. Say, we are the fullness of him who fills all things. And another translation of that same passage says, we are the completion of him who completes all things everywhere. Now that just blows my mind. That just overwhelms my spirit to think that you and I and all the rest of those who are united to God in a covenant relationship could actually bring him to completion. But that's how important relationship is in the sight of heaven. We think relationships are expendable and discardable and unnecessary. And yet God recognized in the beginning the importance of relationship and what it could produce. Praise God. Next, let's look at God's original intention. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, God said, Let us make man in our image. Notice there's a singular and a plural word contained in the same line. Let us, that's plural, make man in our image, that's singular. Not images, but singular, image. And that shows the plurality yet the oneness of the Godhead because yes, it is comprised of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but Jesus is the image of the invisible God. There are three, yet there is one. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. And so the first two things on God's list of priorities is image transfer and dominion transfer. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over all the works of your hands. Think of that. God reached down into the most worthless substance, dust, to create the creature of highest worth to give him dominion over all things. And we haven't seen that fully realized yet. We have a little tiny expression of dominion in us now, but nothing compared to what it will blossom into we have dominion over sin. We have dominion over the lower nature. We have dominion over Satan. We have dominion ultimately over death and the grave and hell itself, all the arch enemies of the human race. We have dominion over sin shall no longer have dominion over you nor any of the other things I mentioned because you're not under the law, you're under grace. And that's worth praising God for that God hasn't backed up from his original commitment. In either of those areas, he's still making people into his image. It's a slow process. It's a really slow process because it takes all kinds of situations and circumstances and disappointments and challenges and hopes and dreams and crushed hopes and dreams and restored hopes and dreams. And throughout the whole process, God's original purpose keeps coming to the surface. I'm going to make you more loving. I'm going to make you more forgiving. I'm going to make you more merciful. I'm going to make you more strong. I'm going to make you more patient. I'm going to make you more humble. All of these divine attributes 
are being brought forth out of the dust, the cursed dust of the lower nature that we will one day see our bodies return to, releasing our spirits into the higher expression of image transfer and dominion that God intended in the beginning. But I want you to see something very interesting. Let us make men in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So ladies, there's no reason to be scared of mice and lizards and snakes. So God created man in his own image. Now watch this next statement. You might want to quote it out loud with me. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So originally, both Adam and Eve were part of the same package. They were both part of the same being, and then God separated the female out of the male aspect of Adam. But male and female, he created them. And so they were all referred to as Adam. Eve did not get her own name until after the fall. He called their name Adam, the Bible says. And there's a mystery in that. Adam can mean, it can mean ground from the Hebrew word Adama, or a Hebrew Messianic Jewish friend of mine told me that he felt like Adama uh, was not the correct word from which Adam was drawn, but rather possibly on another level, it was drawn from A, which stands for Adonai, which means Lord, and Dam, D-A-M in Hebrew means blood. And so it meant the blood of the Lord. So when he breathed into Adam's nostrils, that's when the blood, this is what he felt, that is when the blood was, coagu- uh, was created in his veins and he became a living soul. Whether or not that's true is up to question, but I found it interesting to get that point of view from him. So God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. So we are image bearers. Now, that is a symbol that spans the covenants. And I want to show that to you in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 30 through 32. Now, when, when Adam saw Eve, he made a statement. He said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So Adam was motivated by what he saw Eve was motivated by what she heard. Think of that, because when Eve heard Adam, his words, that bonded them. But when Adam saw Eve, that bonded him. Because women tend to be motivated by the beauty and the sound of the words that express real love more than what they see more than what they see. Men are more oriented to what they see, women to what they hear. Maybe that's why women talk a whole lot more than men. Who knows? (laughs) But anyway, there's a symbol that spans the covenants because in Ephesians 5, 30 through 32, Paul is talking about the relationship of a man and a woman and how he that loves his wife loves himself No man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. And so he's talking about the union of Adam and Eve so that these two became one. These two became one. Let me say it again. These two became one. And then he translates it into a whole different level of meaning. And he says concerning the heavenly bridegroom, We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Think of that. That is such a profound thought that he exists in us and through us. He has his own body in the heavenlies, yes, but still because he's utterly united to his bride, would you say it out loud with me? Let's quote the first line of that verse. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then listen to what Adam said. This is a quote 
of the original statement Adam made. He said after he laid eyes on the woman and said this is woman because she came out of man, he said for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother. See, man was blaming women from the beginning. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And then listen to the next part. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Come on, quote that out loud with me. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So there's a hidden, mysterious, a kingdom mystery hidden within the story in Genesis of the creation of Adam and Eve. When God created Eve, he didn't use an external substance. He reached inside of Adam. And the creation of Eve caused the first shedding of blood to take place in this world. And it was through the shedding of blood, the opening of uh, the passageway in Adam's side where God could pull out the rib. I guarantee you there was some bloodshed attached to that because it would be the shedding of blood that would create a bride later on for the heavenly bridegroom. And she was originally a part of Adam, only to be separated from Adam, and then to be rejoined to Adam. So there were three steps, originally apart, separated from, and joined to. And in like manner, you and I were originally a part of him. The Bible says the spirit goes back to God who gave it. So originally our spirits came out from God himself just like the rib came out from Adam. Our spirits came out from God. Think of that. Then we were separated from him for a season like the rib was separated from Adam as something outside of him, separate from him. So we walked in separateness, distanced from God not connected to God, not understanding God, not in communion with God, not in a relationship with God. But then that marriage day took place when we said, Jesus, come into my heart, fill me with your spirit, wash me in your blood, let me become one with you. I surrender to your lordship. And though separate from him, we were reunited to him. These two became one because The Bible very clearly says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Would you quote that out loud with me? He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, inseparably one. When you mix cream with coffee, it becomes inseparably one. It takes on a new nature, a new appearance, indivisible, inseparable from each other. And in like manner, when your spirit and God's spirit mingled, you became inseparable. He said, nothing shall put asunder. Let no man put asunder. These two shall be one flesh and let no one put asunder. And I believe God says something very similar. When you were united to him in a holy kind of matrimony spiritually and supernaturally, I believe in a sense God spoke over you and said, let nothing divide this person from me. Neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come. Let no other creature, no other person, no other entity, no other spirit, no circumstance, no situation divide this one from me because I have become one with him, one with her. They are part of my bride and my body. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Hallelujah. What a mystery that is. What a mystery that is. Now, let's go to Adam's declaration after the fall. Notice this happened after the transgression. After Eve was deceived. After Adam walked knowingly into sin and rebellion. And they both suffered the consequences. And they both heard a curse pronounced on them and on their offspring. The Bible says Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And I've shared this here before, but I want to reemphasize it again. The word that is translated Eve is from the Hebrew word kavah. 
which means life giver. Now, if Adam had been bound to the misery of their situation and the curse that had enveloped them and the impossibility that was a prison to them, they were cut off from God, thrust out from the garden. It looked like they would pass on this state of spiritual death to their offspring and there would be no way to cure it. But what an act of faith on Adam's part, not to name his wife the death giver, but the life giver. Because of her transgression, she passed on a state of death to all of her offspring, spiritual death, mental death, emotional death, eternal death. And so Adam would have been justified in finding some word that meant death giver and vindictively naming his woman that. But instead, he peered into the hope that he had of restoration for the future because he had one word from God to base his hope on because God said not to Eve, not to Adam. Actually, Adam overheard a conversation between God and the serpent. And he said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. And you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. And so the serpent that introduced death into this realm was ultimately to be crushed himself. That was Adam's hope. So he looked beyond the curse of death and said, Eve will be the mother of all living. So Eve is my mother. Eve is your mother in a spiritual sense and a physical sense, both. The word Eve, the name of the original mother, is only found four times in the Bible, two times in the Old Testament, two times in the New Testament. And yet the figure of Eve looms large in Scripture. And there's so much attached to it. The life giver. Everybody say the life giver. Now remember that because she's a picture, she's a symbol of the bride of Christ who is the life giver. The bride is positioned in a world surrounded by the dead. And I know that's not a very flattering title to give people that are not in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ yet. But look at what 2 Timothy 4.1 says. This is where Paul is admonishing his young follower, his disciple, Timothy. He's shaping him into the role of a pastor. And he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. But he starts out by saying when Jesus Christ comes back again, he will judge between the living and the dead. That's not just talking about those who are alive physically as opposed to those who are dead physically. Because when the Lord comes back again, he's got to distinguish between those who are alive spiritually and those who are dead spiritually as well. And so on a higher level, we are the living, but we're surrounded by those who are the dead. In Luke 20, verse 38, Jesus was having a conversation with certain Sadducees that did not believe in a resurrection. And he said, why did God call himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if all of them have just gone back to the dust and have no existence anymore? He said, for God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And he was referring to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as the living because they somehow escaped this death trap that the world is and found life here. Praise God. He's the God of the living, and thank God we are among the living. I love, love, love 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, that says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. When did that happen? When God breathed into him. God did not breathe just oxygen and nitrogen and gaseous vapors from the atmosphere around the earth into his lungs in a physical way. He breathed soulish existence into him in a spiritual way. 
An alive soul is a soul that is saturated with a living spirit that is saturated with the spirit of God. See? And when God breathed into Adam, he became a living soul. The soul was activated by a living spirit that was activated by the living God. Praise God. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, but the last Adam, everybody say the last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. The first man, Adam, the first Adam was a living soul, but the last Adam was a quickening spirit. What does that mean? The word quickening means life imparting. And that's why in other translations, the last Adam, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, why is he the last Adam? Because there's two Adams, one passed on sin and death to his offspring, the other passed on righteousness and life to his offspring. The first Adam and the last Adam were both beginning points of a race that was to be raised up. And the Last Adam was the second man who is the Lord from heaven, the Bible says. And he became a quickening spirit because when he comes into your life, he finds a dead soul, dead minds, dead emotions, a death state spiritually, but he quickens you back to life. And in the process, he becomes your father and in a physical yet, in a sense, spiritual also way, Eve becomes your mother the life giver that brought you into this world as a human being that would suffer the pain of death for a season but then get in touch with her seed that also can quicken you to life because she was the seed of the woman. She brought forth the seed of the woman after many generations that crushed the head of the serpent. Now, if Jesus was the last Adam, who's the last Eve? If the first Adam had the first Eve and it was literally the wife to whom he was joined and they became one, then the last Adam also must have the last Eve. And the last Eve, therefore, must be the bride to whom the last Adam is married. And on a much higher level, the bride of Christ is the life giver. Because if you're a part of the bride, everywhere you go, you're penetrating atmospheres that are full of death with life. You go into a conversation with somebody that's hopeless and full of despair. You inject life into it. You inject hope for the future. You inject faith. You inject love. And so the life-giving elements of the nature and the character of God are with you constantly being injected into the atmosphere of death that you encounter on a day-to-day basis from those who are ungodly or those who are crushed by life and feel like there is no hope. Well, praise God. Let me give you the warning of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16. That scripture says, the man who wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. The congregation of the dead is a way of referencing all the people that live in this world with futility and senselessness. They live, but they never connect with what life is all about. They have compromise. They have sin in their lives. They have rebellion in their lives. They're a part of the congregation of the dead. But thank God we're not a part of the congregation of the dead. We are a part of the congregation of the living because we have found the pathway back to what Adam and Eve lost in the beginning. Thank God I found the path. Thank God you found the path. It wasn't easy to find. I searched a long time before I found it. Have you ever gotten lost in the woods? I have. I've been lost. I used to walk in the woods a lot for hours and hours at a time, four and five hours at a time. And there's been a few times where I kind of lost my bearings and forgot which way to go and thought it I might not make it back to church that night. It's a, it's a scary feeling to recognize that you're lost. But it's a helpful feeling because then you can get about the business of finding the way back. And it's a scary thing to realize you're a lost soul. But there is a way back. 
Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus in his great sermon on the mount said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Listen, the world right now in mass is entering into a state of social and cultural insanity. What is being proposed as a necessary cultural change to remedy racism is really a heightened form of racism in itself. And I won't go into that. Maybe next week I'll get into the insanity of what's going on in our culture that is all designed to crush biblical values. See, the enemy whose head was crushed 2,000 years ago is now trying to crush the head of those who believe, who trust, who understand, who comprehend God. And this is where the crushing is taking place. How am I going to deal with what's going on in the world? How are my children going to deal with what's going on in the world? Well, the God who brought victory 2,000 years ago will bring victory again. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Don't walk the road of destruction. There are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult. God never said it was going to be easy. It's real easy to be an adulterer. It's real easy to be a fornicator. It's real easy to be a drug addict. It's real easy to be drunk. It's real easy to have a contaminated heart. You just jump in and go with the flow of the way the world approaches life. Uh, In fact, there's an old saying that following the path of least resistance makes men and rivers crooked. Following the path of least resistance makes men and rivers crooked because a river always seeks lower ground and less resistance and that makes it easy to keep flowing. And sometimes people think it makes it easy to keep going in life to find the least amount of commitment, the least amount of consecration to God that you can get by with and still survive. But it makes for a crooked life. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life and there are few who find it. And the Greek word that is translated life there is the Greek word zoe, which means divine life, God life, resurrection life. Praise God. So it's not just talking about eternal life in the great beyond. It's talking about real living right here, right now. There's few that find out what life is all about. Life is just a series of self-gratifying moments to most people. They're gratified by goals in life, by money and possessions and relationships, many of which are not godly in the sight of heaven. They're always indulging in this and indulging in that to gratify self. And they haven't learned yet that you find life where you find death. You have to die with him in order to live with him. You have to be crucified with him in order to be resurrected in him. Because the Bible says God has quickened us together with him. We who were dead in trespasses and sins have been quickened together with Christ. We've been made alive. Praise God. Because we met the one who is alive. Let's go to the last scripture. John chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus said, This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes on him or in him may have everlasting zoe, everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Everybody, if you would please say this with me. Say, I have everlasting life right now. That's not something I'm going to have. That's something I have right now. Oh, I may shed this body like a lizard sheds its skin. I may shed this body that is a temporary enclosure to my soul, 
but my spirit man already is experiencing everlasting life. Heaven on earth connection covenantally with God. This is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. That's when you and I eternally will be among the living. Hallelujah. Why? Because the two needs have been met in our lives. Or actually three. Three needs. The main three needs for every human being are breath, and water, and food in order to survive. Those are the staples of life. You have to have breath. You can't go most people over three minutes maximum without breathing, or you keel over dead. You can't go over normally, most people, three days without some kind of liquid, or you keel over dead. There are some who break that rule, but normally speaking. And then you can't usually go over 40 days without food, without a detrimental effect of death having its way. Uh, So those are the staples of life, breath, water, and bread, or food and water and breath, reverse order. Well, Jesus is the breath giver because the same one who breathed into Adam's nostrils and imparted a breath of life that day that infused his spirit with divine nature is the same one who breathed in the upper room and said, receive the Holy Spirit and restore to them what Adam lost. So he is the breath giver. He's also the living water because he said it that out of the belly of one who believes will flow rivers of what kind of water? Living water which is representative of his spirit. And then he said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Living bread, living water, living breath make up living people. Thank God I found the bread. Thank God you found the bread. Thank God I found the water of life. Thank God you found the water of life. And thank God I was reinstated with the breath of life and you were reinstated with the breath of life. The bread of life, the water of life, and the breath of life have caused us to be the living. And that's the revelation of the mystery of the original mother, Eve, and how it finds ultimate fulfillment in the one Eve symbolized, the bride to whom God will be married eternally. And remember, Eve shared Adam's dominion. God gave them dominion. And you will share the dominion that belongs to the bridegroom. The eternal bride of Christ, the queen of heaven, will in a sense be the ruling hierarchy of a new creation. Kings and priests reigning with him forevermore. Too boggling to the mind to even entertain such thoughts and yet they're written in God's word. And all I feel like doing is saying thank you. Can we lift our voices right now and thank 